Oop, hello, hello, oopala. Okay, hope this works. Got this recording. I got the things to record. I'm doing it. What up? Pakakatuku. Faster and more efficient. Each week we'll explore one idea with the potential to change the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. Subscribe to the best new ideas in money wherever you listen to podcasts. For years, every time you opened an app on your phone, you were identified behind the scenes by a string of unique numbers and letters that allowed tracking technology to learn more about you. That knowledge, of course, is what advertisers use to target you with specific ads. But their ability to do that is getting cut back. Some regulators and privacy advocates want to see less tracking online. And the makers of smartphone operating systems are getting on board too. Apple has already changed its system, giving users the choice to opt out of being tracked by apps on their iPhones. And on Wednesday, Google said it plans to introduce new privacy restrictions to cut back on tracking across apps on Android phones. So what could this mean for advertisers and users? Joining us to discuss this is our tech reporter, Trip Mickel. Hi, Trip. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So can you start by explaining, you know, what exactly is Google proposing? You know, that's the tricky thing about this. Google is proposing that in two years' time, it will overhaul essentially kind of like the framework or the underpinnings of the digital ad industry on Android smartphones, which account for about 85% of the smartphones in the world. Apple already took steps to reduce tracking for iPhone users. How are Google's plans or its prospective plans different? Google's taken a very different approach from Apple. When Apple made its decision, it said, here's what we're doing. We're going to introduce a feature that essentially asks you each time you kind of begin using an app, do you want this app to track you when you're not using the app or not? And that gave people to opt in or opt out of tracking, you know, by apps for advertising purposes. Google hasn't said at all what they plan to do. In fact, what they said is that much like a federal agency, they're in a phase of rulemaking where they're going to introduce a concept. They're going to collect feedback from privacy advocates, regulators, and app developers and then by the end of the year, they plan to have a beta version of the changes that they want to introduce to limit app tracking. What's the reasoning behind this? Why are the makers of smartphone operating systems taking these steps? You know, the industry has been kind of pushed in this direction, largely by Europe, which has raised a lot of concerns about the way that apps and kind of the advertising industry covertly gathers information and data on users, particularly on smartphones. And because of this, and because of some of the efforts by lawmakers in Europe to suspend or at least bring some better understanding and some consumer protections to users out there, you know, the two big mobile operators, Apple and Google, are having to make adjustments to what they're doing. Given that Google hasn't come out with a ton of specifics, I mean, how likely is this to alleviate any of those regulatory concerns? What they're saying is that, you know, their aim is to address and curtail the way that apps gather information covertly right now. You know, if you take them at their word on that, then in two years' time, we're going to basically have an advertising industry that's going to have to operate and function in a totally different fashion than what it did over the past decade or so. Yeah, let's talk about that because there are a lot of potential impacts here. What reaction has there been to these plans from the broader online ad industry? The ad industry kind of shrugged at this in part because it's going to take two years for it to be introduced. And so, you know, I think the reaction was largely like, well, thank you for the heads up. And also, thank you for giving us time to continue to operate exactly as we've been operating. I think as we get closer and as Google reveals more about what it plans to do, you know, whatever it introduces will be evaluated for how far-reaching the repercussions will be for the industry. Um, what Apple introduced was calamitous. Um, essentially, 80% of people opted out of being tracked on apps. 
Do we expect that the ad industry will have any input or that its reaction will affect the rules that Google does come up with? It will have input. I mean, Google said we are going to seek their input. So certainly they're going to weigh in and provide some feedback. You know, how Google deals with that is to be determined. I mean, the other tricky thing that Google has to navigate here, unlike Apple, Apple, you know, the lion's share of its revenue comes from selling iPhones. Google, 80% of its revenue comes from digital ad sales. So it faces not just you know, the concern of others in the ad industry that it could be self-serving, but also the concern of antitrust regulators who could and probably will be watching this for uh, whether or not they're self-serving and anti-competitive in anything they introduce. Right. It's interesting when Alphabet, Google's parent, gave its uh, earnings last fall, it didn't seem to be particularly hit by Apple's changes. I wonder if that's feeding at all into its decision to kind of move forward with some privacy changes. Really, this has far less to do with how Apple's changes affected Google. It really has to do with like the regulatory environment and the privacy environment and the awareness that has kind of quietly bubbled up over the last several years about how this ad industry on mobile phones worked, the information it was collecting, and the consequences of that. I mean, for me as a reader of the Wall Street Journal, it was really interesting the work that Sam Schechner did on this, where he shed some light on how Facebook had written some code that would be embedded in apps like Flow Ovulation Tracker, and that would then feed information back to Facebook, which then could, you know, deliver ads that were micro-targeted to, you know, a woman who might be pregnant or something like that. And, you know, that I think that just opened everybody's eyes to just how this industry can work. So we've talked about what this might mean for Google, what it might mean for advertisers. What about for users? I mean, does this fundamentally change the way that they use their mobile phones or, you know, the way they see advertising? We don't know, unfortunately, with Android what this means because they simply haven't told us. It's going to be a long, protracted process in which the, you know, whatever solutions it comes up with could change multiple times um, before they actually get to the finish line. That being said, we already know from watching what's happened for iPhone users that their experience of using apps is different. If you open an app for the first time, you're delivered a prompt that asks if you want this app to track you all the time, sometimes, or never. And you get to select and click you know, which of those three options you want for that particular app. And that can affect how that app functions. So, you know, if you look at that, there is a possibility that depending on what Google does, that users' experience on Android phones could change and that their kind of quote-unquote user experience. Hello, I stopped it. I think that if um, anything is tracking you or is this recording? I don't know. Anything tracking you or doing that, whatever it is, it's not on, eh? You would not understand it. I say YouTube, YouTube, Facebook, Google, International Computer Network, you understand? And it fucks you, it fucks you. Kill the virus! This week on the Vergecast, Alex Cram. Okay, I'm now got it on this other one. Anyway, you shouldn't be doing that anyway. <clears throat> cyber attack and all this tech news and everything that's news whatever whatever you you got it wrong man you got it wrong f- whatever whatever it's n- for us who don't know how to use a computer for us who are dumb and stupid goofy we want it to be simple if it's free much better international computer network you want money out of us don't you you want to make uh, things out of us my god, my god, my god, how do you get to lick the pussy? Fuck you! We don't want that! We want to be nice, beautiful people, I right? see? Uh, better than that, mother, uh, please. Okay, I'm gonna put this on. Here we go. Here, and do. I love you! Say that vaccines are designed to kill. Another one is that, I guess I have these memorized now. This is my pop quiz. Um, yeah, but I mean, I'm so impressed. Like, the amount of brain space left for Rogan things is rapidly dwindling. Another one is you can't have COVID parties. So you can't encourage, like, COVID contagion parties. I don't remember the last one. But, like, you can see from these rules that it's pretty easy to not break them. Oh, it's not to drink bleach. Yep, it's bleach. I went and looked at it. Duh. <laughs> 
can't tell people to drink bleach. Those are the rules. And so we can easily understand now why Joe Rogan has been kept live and why Spotify has hesitated slash has not really moderated his show, even though they say they've taken down some episodes. Rogan obviously does not, I don't think, he believes COVID is real, seemingly. And he might suggest that people don't get vaccinated, but it's not because he thinks they're designed to kill people. Didn't he get COVID? He's had COVID. I would hope he thinks it's real. And when Aaron Rodgers had COVID, he consulted with Joe Rogan. Right. Honestly, at any moment, I can turn this into an Aaron Rodgers conversation. So I just, Kranz, if you could keep me in line, that would be no, much appreciated. No, you can't do it. You can talk about The Rock, though. Yeah. <laughs> we all have to exercise restraint here. He will potentially encourage you to take ivermectin, but not bleach. Anyway, so that was on Sunday. Daniel Lex, Spotify CEO, also with that, like issued a press release blog post basically being like, we're a creator platform. We're a platform. We're not going to, you know, do more than this. These are our rules. So then fast forward more to this week, more, there's just more conversation among musicians, among other podcasters and in-house podcast science verse says that they're not going to publish episodes un unless they are dedicated to debunking misinformation on Spotify's own platform. I feel like that didn't get enough play, right? Yeah. Like imagine if, I don't know, SB Nation was like, we're not going to publish any more sports content unless it's dedicated to debunking everything The Verge publishes. Yes. Right. Like, yeah. That is like inside of Spotify, its own podcast is like, we're done. We're all we're going to do is debunk Rogan. And they're like, I don't know. That, it's, that one's the one that's just like, it washed over everything because there's so much noise. Mm -hmm. But I was like, that is a r insane situation. Yeah, it's it's brave, honestly, of them to do that. Um, and we can get to Spotify did actually respond. Hot Pot Insiders got the scoop on this one, but um, <laughs> we can get to it. So, yeah. So then Wednesday, Spotify had its earnings call. Broadly, like everything's looking good from a corporate perspective. You know, users are up, subscribers are up. Notably, the whole podcast play is about getting into ad revenue. So ad revenue now accounts for 15% of their total revenue, which is a big deal for them because like they just launched the Spotify ad network for podcasts like broadly this year. I think last year it was. Um so also on Wednesday, they took the opportunity to host a town hall internally with employees. We got the entire audio from that. And within it, there's a lot to parse. But you can see that a lot of what Daniel Eck, the CEO, talks about is basically how important Joe Rogan is to the business. And you could probably see that reflected in their earnings. Um, he's critical to the entire podcasting ad apparatus. Um, he also makes the argument that they are a platform, not a publisher. Neelai, I know you're going to want to. I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, Neil, I'll let you talk about the hardware part, but they actually talk about why they got into exclusive podcasts and licensing in the first place, and it actually has to do with hardware deals with Apple. Or not with Apple. They didn't mention Apple. They mentioned Tesla. They mentioned Google, and they mentioned Amazon. Yeah, I, that part to me is fascinating. He was like, and I, I wasn't clear if this was podcast in general or Spotify in general, right? But he was like, when we were trying to get deals with Google and Amazon and even Tesla, we didn't have the leverage because our catalog looked just like everyone's catalog. And you can read that as music. Basically, everybody has the same music catalog. You can read that as podcasts when podcasts were an open RSS ecosystem. Everybody has access to the same podcast. So they had no differentiation. And then they, they signed the Rogan deal. And I'm guessing now, you know, people who want to listen to Joe Rogan on Google smart speakers have to make a deal with Spotify. Amazon, I think, did the same. And then Tesla famously has not had a Spotify app. But I'm guessing a bunch of Tesla owners want to listen to Joe Rogan. So now Spotify can say, if you want Joe Rogan, you got to put our app on your infotainment. I was just going to say the Venn diagram of Tesla owners and Joe Rogan listeners, it's, it's very good. It's I mean, I have to imagine this helps Elon wanting to get Spotify on a Tesla, too, because Elon loves Joe Rogan. I mean, that's just, that is fascinating, that whole dynamic of them needing exclusives for these deals. Yeah, and, and they even say in this town hall as well that the reason they pursued Rogan specifically is because his show was never available on the platform before. And even still, it was the number one most searched podcast. So they were like, we got to get the big dog if we're going to play in this. And they're using it to their advantage as, you know, they should, I guess. After the Rogan deal, just to close this loop, Spotify Premium is now available on Tesla. Right, job, so they guys. were able, once they got the leverage, they were able to go in and say, okay, there's... Now, do I think Daniel Eck and Elon had to sit down and, you know, Eck had like a giant head of Rogan on a, a stick that was like, you want this? Like, 
Um, I feel like we've been doing a lot of reenactments of CEO meetings on this episode of the Birchcast, and I believe Why that's is it on a stick? Why is it on a stick? Because he's decapitated. Okay. What were those big vinyl... What were they called? Like fat cats? You know what I'm talking about? Fat heads. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, no, that makes sense. I was like, I went to a much more murderous place, and I was like, that feels like he's not going to be out doing podcasts. Um, he's like, you want to build a robot, Elon? I've got just the brain for you. Um, I don't know. But that is fascinating to me, because you have Spotify trying to do ads, which is, uh, as we just learned, a business that is very hard if you cannot connect your ad placement to data about what people want. So this is the business they want to grow. This is the business that Apple is crushing Facebook on. Spotify and Apple have the testiest relationship of all, right? Like Spotify has filed complaint after complaint in Europe about Apple's behavior. Apple, they have websites about how Apple is unfair. They are the heart of the coalition of app fairness. It's <laughs> a good name. Like, how do you grow that business if everywhere else you look advertising is becoming a bad business because you cannot connect the data. Like, I don't know where Spotify is getting its tracking data from apart from here's what you listen to for podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, but like the sad part is in the podcast industry, traditionally all they've had is IP addresses. So like ge geography, um, and like what kind of device you're listening on. So even just a little music data is helpful. <laughs> oh my God. That's so Aww. sad. <laughs> Right, so Spotify has uh, what's it, dynamic ad insertion. So when you stream a podcast, they can stop it and put in whatever ad. Like they can target an ad. Oh, streaming ad yeah. insertion. Yeah. We we have dynamic ad insert. I I feel like I have to disclose our podcast is served by Megaphone, which is owned by Spotify. Yeah. I don't. I've never yeah. even seen the Megaphone interface. Andrew, our engineer and producer, I'm sure he's had to look at it. <laughs> but like, I just there's your disclosure. Disclosure is our brand. But that, that Spotify buying up the entire tech stack of podcasts so they can make this ad play. But right next to it, Ashley, I think you're saying like the data has been historically so bad that even just knowing that you like Beyonce is like better it's helpful. than advertising in <laughs> Apple Podcasts. And your age, gender. What I, I mean, not to get too into the text, the ad stuff, but I mean, what's interesting is like the reason why Rogan is also especially lucrative is because... The dude sells a ton of crap. Like, if you're an advertiser and you advertise on Rogan, like, he, he's huge for you. Like, he moves product. And so... He moved ivermectin. There you go. So people, like, really seek him out as an advertiser, which, you know, they need to really get people in the door. And then when you buy ads on Rogan, you have to buy ads on the rest of the Spotify podcast catalog. So they're really using him to just, like, jumpstart this operation. I just I want to go back to the the, the the concept that they needed Joe Rogan to get leverage to get on platforms that aren't Apple, given that isn't their primary com competitor in the music space, Apple. Yeah, I mean, it's what Neil said, like, and this is something I actually wrote about this week is like RSS. Joe Rogan's been around forever. Like, all this came about because people want to moderate Joe Rogan now that he's getting paid reportedly a hundred million dollars from Spotify. And like prior to this deal, RSS has allowed him to be distributed basically everywhere other than Spotify. And no one ever really like spoke up about him, maybe a little bit. It was considered controversial, but it never kind of reached his fever pitch. And so Spotify kind of brought this issue upon themselves specifically to gain this leverage and close off the ecosystem to gain a competitive leg up on competition. So, but they would say they're just a platform. But I just don't understand why they, they were like, we have to, like, I just don't get why they needed the leverage of this one podcaster. Well, it's the entire exclusives. It's all the exclusives, not just okay, Rogan. Okay. But like if you like Rogan or you like Heavyweight or whatever from Gimlet and it's not available through your Alexa device, you might start being pissed and be like, where's my Rogan? They got the like modern day Howard Stern. I mean, isn't, isn't his show like listened to by like more of like than all cable primetime combined? Like it's, I mean, his reach is massive. It's like pretty safe to assume tens of millions. They say he's the number one podcaster in 93 markets. Yeah. I mean, they got Howard Stern. I mean, they went for the top and they got it. So it's, I, I mean, I can see why they did it. They wanted the best in terms of reach, in terms of, you know, numbers. Not saying best in terms of content. But. If Harry and Meghan had delivered their podcast last year, <laughs> would we still be in this position we're in right now? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know how there's like shockwaves before an earthquake? 
Yeah. The tremors before this earthquake were like a bunch of stories that were like, what happened to all those podcast deals that Spotify signed? Like, I mean, my entire author page right now is Spotify stories and not just because of Rogan. It was they shut down an in-house studio. I've written about like programmatic ads kind of going wrong on their platform. Like it's been building. So they've got this big business and we haven't talked about the platform versus publisher thing because I want you to <laughs> the headache that it's causing. <laughs> um, we talked about it last week. We did, but now we know, like we have this like line from Mac that honestly just exhausts. Like my jaw is clenching just thinking about it, but I just want to finish the podcast business. Thing. What's fascinating to me in connecting it to, to Facebook is like their service is built on renting music that everyone else can rent. And they do it, it like artists are mad at Spotify. Artists don't make any money, right? This is why Neil Young and Joni Mitchell and whoever else can just like bail. But they have no differentiation there except for like user experience, right? And playlists and potentially your friend lists and network effects and whatever. But like kind of who cares? But this is still the most competitive market in tech that I can think of. Like when I joke that YouTubers, like the end point of every YouTuber's life cycle is a video about how they're mad at YouTube, like they're still like they're still on YouTube. Like they can make that video and they can <laughs> right, and then they have to make a big decision about what kind of life they want to lead, and they all say on YouTube. We get mad at Facebook, and maybe it took what four years of sustained negative Facebook stories for them to lose one million daily actives in a quarter. And we feel like that's going to take the business. It's like still not a huge effect. No, and it's not that one million is not even really because of the PR. I mean, I'm sure the PR has a role in it, but the products just are getting irrelevant in terms of the way it's designed for younger people. I mean, that's like the hard truth. I mean, that may be an unpopular view of it, but I don't think it was the PR that led to the one million. Right. So, so it's still like yeah, right. But it's Spotify. Like, and you can just go down the list. Like, you're mad at Google search. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> enjoy being. That's not going away. Spotify is one where if you're mad, you can go. Yeah, and there's competition, right? I mean, that's the difference. Like, in perfect competition. Yeah, and that's the difference between, you know, Apple and Google and Spotify and Meta, right? The way, like, platforms versus, I mean, I was, this is, like, very Ben Thompson-y, but, like, his whole thing is platforms work versus aggregators, you know? Companies that aggregate attention are much more vulnerable to this kind of stuff, to competitive pressures than platforms, you know, that lock people into their platform. And Spotify is not a platform. It's a publisher. <laughs> All right, then we have to talk about it. I just wanted to make that point. Like, they are trying to build this walled garden podcast ecosystem because it is the thing that protects them from competition. And it's the thing that gives, and that protection gives them leverage to distribute the app on all these platforms that would otherwise just say, like, you want music in your Tesla? Just pay us the money and all the music will be here. Or you want music on your Amazon Echo, pay us $4 a month and we'll give you an Amazon music subscription to it. That's what Amazon would prefer. That's why they have that plan. But Spotify's saying, well, you want what these people want is Joe Rogan. And they're already paying for us and they're going to mad at you if you ask them to pay it. So I just like, from a business perspective, I think it's fascinating. From a moral perspective, the platform versus publisher thing is just such pure corporate both sides nonsense. First of all, just definitionally, Spotify is not a platform. I dare you to try to upload some shit to Spotify. This right is now. the lawyer Neil I was waiting for. Like, Let's go. You cannot do it. Like, how do you get, you cannot do it. You have to go through some intermediary. There's one place where you can upload stuff to Spotify. It's Anchor, their user-generated podcast platform that has the programmatic ads problem and mostly has ads for Anchor running on it, according to Ashley's report. Yes. That's it. That's what they got. That's their user-generated content. I'm guessing that's where, when they're like, we took down 20,000 episodes, I'm guessing those are all Anchor podcasts. Everything else is ingested through a megaphone or some other distribution service, right? Yeah, through a hosting platform. But, like, the key thing in this case with them is that they're paying Rogan. Well, so they're paying Rogan. But, like, they also own The Ringer, and they own Gimlet, and, they, like, they have this deal with the Obamas. Like, do you think the people at The Ringer are just, like, we are owned by a platform and we have complete editorial? No, they work for a company. The company is liable for what they publish. The people at Gimlet, exactly the same deal. If you were to, if, if Joe Rogan said something horribly defamatory towards someone, that person isn't going to like, ah, well, Spotify is just a platform. No, they're going to sue Spotify too. And I, the, I just don't think they see that accountability because they say they're a platform. And it's just nonsense. I mean, I think they see that accountability. I think that's why they say they're a platform, right? Like, 
Yeah, I'm sure they understand the argument and where it puts them. Well, can I just read the can I read the line that makes yeah. my jaw clench? Spotify doesn't fit neatly into just one category, said Daniel Eck. Quote, we are defining an entirely new space of tech and media. We are a very different kind of company, and the rules of the road are being written as we innovate. That's a lie. The, ro- <laughs> the, 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 the road was paved. Sorry. The road was paved like a decade ago. Netflix has paved the road. There are so many other companies that have paved the road, and Spotify doesn't get to just act like it's new to kind of divert attention from the fact that they paid a man $100 million, and now he says really stupid things that destroy Neelai's love of the Green Bay Packers. Like, they, they don't get to... They don't get to I just know make that up. Aaron did not perform well in that game because he was distracted by the noise. I'm just saying. It, I should be it's, very excited about the Super Bowl, and I'm not. I, Eck did say this about Rogan, and this, you know, I get this. You do run a platform. You have to say this from time to time. Eck said this about Rogan. There are many things Joe Rogan says that I strongly disagree with and find very offensive. Okay. Like, I just... I think the idea that you're going to sign this exclusive deal to distribute something on what you consider to be a platform and then not accept the editorial choice you have made to take that thing because you need it to support your business goals is a total cop out. I completely understand the business goals. You need leverage to get distribution for your app, which would otherwise be undifferentiated from everyone's content catalog. And you've got to build this advertising business around podcasts because the you know, 15% of all the money you make on user fees for music have to go back to the artist. Like, you're just, your margins are compressed forever. Yeah, but those are deals that are just written. Neil, you're coming at this as an editor in chief. Daniel Eck is the CEO of a tech company. That, like, he's not a, he doesn't think of himself as a, all this discussion about Joe Rogan, I've been listening to a lot of it, not even just this podcast. We in the media are obsessed with this because we're obsessed with responsibility and, the responsibility you have to like put good information out into the world and like the checks that come with that. And like these companies don't see themselves as that. And even if they experiment with it, it's not their North star. It's like taking responsibility for the things that people on their platform say. Okay. 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 If you have an app or anything or a different um, international computer network company, Spotify or anything that is going to be a platform to put things like podcast or any news or anything, they're all going to get paid and they get in there somehow and they get paid and you get paid, everybody get 50-50 for the company or for that place, for the where you at, TikTok or whatever, you be famous or you're not, or this, that, and the other. How can China be the technology of the world? How can China win? Because America won't let them have Google or a search engine or something like this or like that or anything European or Australian, New Zealand. We don't win. We don't know how international computer network work, work works okay the next episode please this marketplace tech podcast is sponsored by okay okay it's now the tech po- podcast but you must be nice to one another be a good family please Axonius. The Axonius cybersecurity asset management platform correlates asset data from existing solutions to provide an always up-to-date inventory, uncover gaps, and automate action, giving security and IT teams the confidence to control complexity. In Europe, are sending U.S. businesses scrambling. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace Tech. I'm Kimberly Adams. Your push in the port's web traffic violated French civilians' rights. That is it. Why digital privacy rules in Europe are sending U.S. businesses scrambling. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace Tech. I'm Kimberly Adams. Last week, a French court found the local company's use of Google Analytics, which tracks and reports web traffic, violated French civilians' rights. 
That decision mirrored a ruling in Austria just a month before. It's part of a larger push in the European Union to manage how American companies use European residents' data. The EU and the U.S. had an agreement saying American companies and laws provided adequate protections for European user data. But in July of 2020, European courts severed that pact. Saying the agreement didn't provide enough protections from surveillance, negotiations for a new deal are ongoing. Caitlin Fennessy is vice president of the nonprofit International Association of Privacy Professionals. She says because of recent court decisions abroad, the pressure is on for companies and negotiators. The need for these data transfers is growing, while the compliance options to allow them is, is shrinking rapidly. A lot of these rules were built around commercial protections, but as we all know, companies truly can't control the laws that govern surveillance. And so there is a bit of a challenge here where companies are being called on to address challenges that, that truly governments need to work together to solve on the uh, surveillance side. What does the current state of play mean for how a company like Google operates in Europe? It means that the risk profile that companies are, are facing right now is just a lot higher. Now, basically, the first two enforcement actions that we saw come out of Europe around Google Analytics are the first two decisions in 101 cases that were framed similarly across Europe. So we can expect in the weeks and months ahead to see dozens of additional enforcement actions come down similarly. Importantly for businesses, I think, the risk is not just of enforcement, but the risk is that their EU partners will themselves recognize the heightened risk that they face as this enforcement cascades and pull back from partnerships with U.S. partners. With these decisions coming down, companies kind of scrambling, what do all these recent developments mean for the ongoing negotiations between the U.S. and the EU for a potential new agreement? There's no question that these latest enforcement actions just turn the ratchet in, in terms of the pressure that everyone faces here. Both sides, the U.S. and the EU, do not want to see another framework fall. And I think we can all expect it will be challenged nearly immediately. And so they're working to build something that will hold up and, and will be sustainable. Yeah, and I mean, with all these decisions coming down, are companies proactively making any changes to try to get ready, or are they sort of in a wait-and-see moment? They have been proactive. They've been conducting transfer impact assessments and looking at options to localize and build data centers in Europe. So I think a big question that companies and governments face is, you know, how much will change about how these services are structured and operate before a government uh, negotiated solution is reached? And are those changes in a direction that U.S. and EU policymakers and businesses think is helpful or, or not? Caitlin Fennessy of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. And now for some related links. Google released a statement earlier this year calling for a new framework for data sharing between the EU and the US, and the company put out a blog post on Google Analytics, the target of the cases in Austria and in France. In that post, Google says it has worked to meet the EU's privacy standards when it comes to data transfers across the Atlantic. You can read the full statements at the links on our website, marketplacetech.org. We'll also have links to a recent Politico EU article on the French decision and what it means for data transfers across the Atlantic more broadly. Speaking of data collection, the EU is not the only one re-evaluating its practices. Just yesterday, Google announced it's doing a little self-regulation, adopting new policies to limit ad tracking across apps on its Android devices, following in Apple's footsteps a year later. 
But those official changes, like negotiations, will take some time. I'm Kimberly Adams, and that's Marketplace Tech. Okay, amigo, now it's going a long way, and I don't know how to stop this, but I'm going to do something about these um, policies that Europeans put out because they're tough, they're strong, and they can't... You, uh, no, you, you lose. They say the European Union or European um, Parliament might say, Section this, you're fucked. Section, you, you gotta follow them. See, so who owns the internet? America, China, who, what, 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 where? Hey, explain it to me. Who, how do we get rich? How do we make money, amigo? No, comprende, ah? Eh? La lata pa patata. Chocolate, po puto mierda, faca malaco. Eh, hey. anyway, I oh, love you too, but I'm gonna put this one on now, and that's the end of it. SBS on the money with Ricardo Gonzalez. Hi everyone, it's a daily 10 minute business and finance news wrap for this Monday the 14th of February 2022. Later we'll take a closer look at the direction of new and used car prices. We'll speak to the CEO of carsales.com. But first to Crown Resorts and its board has... Rec- okay, okay. Before we go anywhere, Australia... You are having a very difficult time. Uh, you, some you win, some you lose, and the one in between uh, is confused. You know, how I see on the news, oh, oh, they broke in and 250 cars and, and this, that, and then they talk about Snoop Doggy Dog. Snoop Doggy Dog, the rapper? No, 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 no. Who's making money, hip hop music or the music of America? Oh, is really, really war in Russia? Is it war in Russia or not? Come on, kill the pirates. We are protesting in Canberra, the capital of Australia. Hardcore, you know, Aussie Cossack and Jimmy, uh, Abby, uh, Mimi, uh, whatever. There's people on Google, Google it. Why are we protesting a lot? Why are we crazy? Well, what's going on? Why are people getting let off the hospitals? Less, less workers, less this, less that, less... It's, in, it's fucked. It's the way it is no good. We need to love one another. We need to have beautiful people doing beautiful things. But now the country can't control itself. We need to help America. Well, we'll do this. Okay, no worries. Listen and reply. Listen and reply. I love you. Soy chileno. Closer look at the direction of new and used car prices. We'll speak to the CEO of carsales.com. But first to Crown Resorts and its board has recommended an $8.9 billion takeover by private equity firm Blackstone. Now, it's Blackstone's fourth attempt. So what now for the business and the casino operator, the sector, and what about its major shareholder, James Packer? For more, I spoke earlier with James Kirby. He's the wealth editor at The Australian. James, firstly at $13.10 per share, is this a good deal for shareholders? Yes, it's certainly a good deal for shareholders. You've got to remember this company has been through the wars. It's been more or less the same price for a number of years. And the fair value estimated in the market is just a tad higher than this, but this is a cash offer, so pretty good. So, so given, given the, the regulatory, regulatory issues, issues, the, the public, public scrutiny, scrutiny over the past few years especially, what's, what's the appeal of these assets for Blackstone? Well, the appeal of the assets for someone like Blackstone is, first of all, they're not the Packers, right? So they're clean in that respect as an international institutional group. They've got experience in running casinos in the U.S. And really, in many ways, the only way for a casino tourism group from here is up. Uh, As you mentioned, James Packer, now he's the biggest shareholder of the company. He's unlikely to block this deal, right? Oh, he's quite unlikely to block it. I think the signals are now that he's ready to go. I mean, you must remember this this deal, this offer, apart from being all cash, it's been lifted four times. And it's now pretty much close to what anyone would think is fair value. For a company that still has regulatory hurdles ahead of it, not to mention the actual specific hurdles around the takeover. So it seems likely that he will actually first uh, accept and probably relinquish the bulk of his stake as well.
Okay, okay can, can we, we talk, talk about, about James Packer in a bit more detail, detail because this will end his long relationship with Crown. He's, he's also out of Channel 9 some time ago, so he's winding down his relationship with publicly listed companies. What now for James Packer, do you think? You must remember, Packer, one of the things was he put all, he basically bet everything on, on gambling and the casino empire. Then it was a, a global gamble, then it reduced to a domestic only empire, if you like, in gambling. And then that, in many ways, it, it absolutely certainly deteriorated uh, under his watch and his ownership. So, but he has, first of all, uh, anyone in our economy with $3 billion ready to spend is going to have a lot of new friends. Uh, but someone like Packer is already active. Apparently, he is already in a, in a, in a initial in an investment company that involves Uni Super and may also involve Kerry Stokes. And you'll find that he will be back in action very soon with that amount of cash. It has to be invested. It will be invested, no doubt, in the areas he knows best, property uh, and, and possibly uh, casinos again, entirely likely. What do you think will be his lasting legacy? Oh, look, in some ways, it's a, in some ways, it's a sad story what has happened with James Packer. Uh, I think of the possibilities and opportunities that he was presented with at the start. I think, uh, uh, ironically, I think his legacy will be that he was probably the first major figure in Australian business to mention mental health as an issue and put it on the table. And that really had never been done by a central figure before. And even in the short period of time since he did that. It's now uh, very much uh, acceptable and commonplace and probably a welcome development in that respect. James Kirby there, Wealth Editor at The Australian. Now, the Australian share market today did close stronger. The S&P ASX 200 up by 0.4%, 7,243. That's despite growing geopolitical concerns. Crown shares closed below that $13.10 offer price from Blackstone at $12.60. For more, I spoke earlier with Adam Dawes. He is a senior investment advisor at Shore & Partners. Adam, first of all, the Crown takeover, what does it mean for the sector and for the future of James Packer? Well, certainly for the sector, it's, it's, it's actually really, really good. Certainly Crown Resorts has agreed from their takeover proposal from their US investment firm Blackstone which values the company around about $8.9 billion. And I think that's certainly one of those things. And certainly Star should do well on the back of that. We do know Packer is a, a large shareholder of uh, Crown, and I think he's been a natural seller of this stock for a long time now. So I think this is one way for him to get out of it. And at $13.10, Blackstone has come back. I think it's been about a year now that Blackstone's been at Crown to take it over. And so they've put multiple bids in there. But at $13.10, I think it offers some really good investment as well as it's all cash. So I think that really provides some shareholders with some really good value going forward. International themes are playing out in the share market today. Safe Haven's doing well, the likes of um, oil, um, potentially gold as well, and that's on the back of concerns of Ukraine. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Investors are rushing to the gold mining stocks amid concerns that Russia could invade Ukraine. And look, certainly gold has been one of those ones that's lacklusting. And I certainly know that in 2020, it hit a high of $2,000 an ounce. But at the moment, it's sitting around about $1,859 an ounce. So look, it's still got a little ways to go. But a lot of that defensive buying is certainly coming in there. And Australian gold stocks out of the ASX 200, uh, Nine out of the 10 stocks are all gold stocks in that top sector. So that's really showing you that that defensive buying is definitely coming into our market today. So apart from that, what else is driving the market? Yeah, well, it's been really interesting to see that. The banks have been doing very, very well. And we've seen, we've seen Westpac up 10% today. Sorry, not today. For the week, it's up 10%. And that's really on the back of most of the banking sector about higher interest rates. They're going to do quite well. They get increased revenue and their net, their net interest margin starts to expand. So that's really, really good for the banks. We're certainly seeing the oil stocks moving as well. Obviously, with the Ukraine tensions, oil is certainly looking to uh, go higher. It's currently around $92.00. Uh, barrel. But look, certainly, uh, I think if Russia do invade, we could see uh, oil over $100 a barrel. barrel. So that's certainly uh, affecting the, the stocks today. And then really, yeah, the gold stocks have been pretty good as well. So that's what's really driving the market today. We get jobs numbers out later this week. The jobs market will influence when local interest rates will rise, but there's no doubt we're already in a, a rising interest rate environment globally. How is this going to be impacting the way you invest? 
Look, it certainly does impact the way because we need to be a little bit more cautious about how we're investing clients' money. First of all, that we know that the US is looking to raise interest rates and it's talked about being another seven times. So in the next seven meetings that they're going to have, they're going to raise interest rates. Here in Australia, it certainly looks like they're going to raise it by 50 basis points in August. But really by investing and how you're going to invest in that, you look for interest rate sensitive stocks that will move with higher interest rates. And we've seen computer share uh, doing that. There's certainly that will benefit from higher interest rates. So you just got to be a little bit choosy of how you pick the stocks in the market going forward. And finally, profit reporting season continues. Which one's caught your attention today? Yeah, well, certainly the good one was JB Hi-Fi today. Uh, The stock actually rallied quite considerably, which has been fantastic. The other side of it is that JB Hi-Fi came out and said that they'll do a $250 million buyback, which really, I think, shows that there's confidence in the stock and the market's certainly getting behind that. Albeit some of the sales numbers were a little bit lighter, I think the market really got behind that buyback. So that's that's been a good result, JB Hi-Fi. And probably one that's on the negative side is car sales. Albeit the revenue was a little bit softer in the Australian side of things. Um, they also then said their South Korean uh, division wasn't going to do so well and also that their US division wasn't going to do so well and they decided to not give us any guidance as well. Now, the market didn't take that too well and that's something to definitely be watching uh, going forward for car sales. Okay, that's Adam Dawes there from Shaw and Partners. From the share market, let's go to the new and used car market. Uh, Adam did mention there carsales.com, half-year profit up 22.3% to $74.9 million. But I spoke with the CEO earlier today who was telling me about why and how car prices will continue to remain high. Here is its CEO, Cameron McIntyre. Cameron, you've seen a 22% rise in half-year profit. To what extent has the pandemic been good for business? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the pandemic has been has been good from the point of view that um, consumer behaviours changed. So uh, consumer behaviours moved from you know, looking to buy and purchase cars in the traditional way of attending a dealership um, to being more of a digital experience. So, yeah, we're a digital business. Um, as, as business moves online, which I think it's going to continue to do over time, yeah, that's, that's, that's good for us. Um, we've seen demand for cars uh, grow considerably um, with the pandemic as a result of people avoiding public transport. You've got state um, borders being shut down so people can't travel as much, <coughs> international borders, etc. So, so it's pushed people back into car ownership. But uh, yeah, as a business, we're not just cars, we're caravans and, and boats and you know, all that other leisure equipment um, has, has all seen a big spike in demand uh, as consumer behaviour changes. So you know, they've, they've all been pretty pretty big changes in the way, the way people have, have behaved. We've seen and heard a lot over the past few years about supply chain issues, COVID cases hitting manufacturing around the world and the shortage of semiconductors and how that, hit, that has hit the industry, right? So as economies reopen and demand continues to grow, those issues, from your experience and what you're seeing, have they eased at all? Yeah, I, th- I think yeah, we, we have seen a, a little bit of an ease and it, and it depends. It's manufacturer to manufacturer model to model, um, you know, it, it, it's quite asymmetrical. Um, so, yeah, but I, I'd say to you across the board, we, we've seen uh, some slight improvement, but I think it's going to take some time to keep unwinding because it's not just inside the factory where the challenges are, it's outside the factory too when it comes to, to shipping um, you know, and, and, and taking delivery of product. So our view um, is it's, it's something that's going to continue to to, to evolve, uh, I suspect it's not going to not going to be back to where it was until you know some stage t- towards the back end of this calendar year, maybe even 2023. But uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons why why pricing remains so high. Yeah, can you go into more detail about where prices are going, particularly for both new and used cars? And do you think it is across the board where these prices will remain elevated, and whether it's for those affordable brands or cars, or for those luxury vehicles? Yeah, so I mean, we, we, we've seen yeah, used car pricing uh, has has gone up considerably over the over the last two years uh, post post pandemic. Um, you know, in, in some cases, we, we've seen price rises of anywhere between 30 and 40 uh, percent, which is 
which is significant. Um, and you know, that's, as we've talked about, it's because of strong demand and it's also because of supply constraints. Um, in terms of new vehicle prices, you know, new vehicle prices are, are, are even starting to go up in some cases too. So, um, yeah, I don't see any, any considerable change to pricing in the short term. Um, yeah, you've got consumers with, with significant savings um, that they've pocketed over the course of the last two years. Uh, and and that, that combined you know, with you know, moving back into car ownership and so on, you know, it's going to take some time for, for price to un unwind. So, you know, um, today is probably as good a time as any for consumers to, to, to purchase a car um, you know, while, while these factors keep playing out over time. Finally, um, a lot of talk about the move to electric vehicles. What kind of interest are you seeing on your website for that? And how do you see the, the progression uh, into EVs across the country? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of interest uh, for, for EV. You know, we, we survey consumers regularly and our, our most recent survey uh, found that 50% of consumers that we survey think that they'll be driving an EV inside the next eight years. So. Um, the, the market for EV is going to continue to evolve. The constraints are, as we've talked about, around supply at the moment for, for EVs. Um, the, the other things, the other concerns that consumers tend to have about the adoption of an EV uh, is price. So how are EVs priced relative to your traditional combustion engine cars? Um, how do I charge, recharge my car? Are there enough charging stations around my neighbourhood? And, and, and region where I can simply and easily recharge my car. That's another thing that goes through consumers' minds. And then the third element is around battery life um, and, and how, is, how is the battery life of my EV going to endure over time? So, I mean, these, these are all questions that people are becoming more and more comfortable with. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll continue to see the adoption of EVs uh, change. But the, the first thing that has to change is, you know, we need to see more um, supply, which will, will happen over time. Cameron McIntyre there, the CEO of CarScience.com. This SBS On The Money podcast is provided for informational purposes only. The content on this podcast should not be understood as constituting advice or a recommendation. It is not personal advice and does not consider your personal... This is ABC News Daily. I'm Sam Hawley. Prince Andrew's fall from grace is complete after he settled in the rape case brought by Australian-based woman Virginia Giuffre. It means the prince avoids having to face ruling cross-examination in a US court, which would have delved into the allegations as well as his ties to child sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. Today, the ABC's royal correspondent, Juliet Reedon, on the journey of a disgraced prince what it means for Epstein's other victims. Juliet, first, just broken his silence, so he's, he's saying he can't swear. What else does he say in that, and how did that all play out? I mean, he basically said that, it, that the whole thing never happened. Uh, he, he questions the validity of that photo, and he uh, says he doesn't remember it. He says he has no recollection of having any sexual relations with Virginia Giuffre. Um, I think the, the big issue with that interview was the lack of empathy shown by Prince Andrew. He, he was very uh, arrogant uh, in that interview. The optics on it were terrible. He was very defensive. No. No, no to, to all of it. All of it. Absolutely no, no to all of it. Why would she be saying those things? We wonder exactly the same, but I have no idea. Okay, so things aren't going so well. There's all these allegations in the public domain. It's really damaging for Prince Andrew. Then we fast forward and there's this civil suit in a court in New York. 
So, so we, we were, were at, at the stage, stage where, where a deposition was going to happen. happen. And, and that, that is a witness statement that is made by Prince Andrew and also one that, that lays out his case for court and um, also one from Virginia Jufre. Prince Andrew's was due to happen on March the 10th. But it, it won't happen now, will it? So that brings us to the settlement. Why did he settle? I think that the settlement ha had to happen for Prince Andrew. I mean, this, this is the best outcome for Prince Andrew. He does not want to get to court and have all of the ins and outs of this case laid out there. It was going to be very, very ugly. For Virginia Jufre, who always said she wanted her day in court and that she wanted to Prince Andrew to own up to what he did, she hasn't got that exactly. But what she has got is Prince Andrew accepting that she has suffered. He said that he accepts she has suffered both as an established victim of abuse and as a result of unfair public attacks. Mm. If the reports are right, it's an extraordinary amount of money in this settlement, you know, equivalent of a, around $23 million, some reports seem to say. Where does that money come from? Well, we will never know where that money comes from. Prince Andrew certainly does not have large funds to call on. We know that he has sold his ski property in Verbier, and we know that the proceeds of that will most likely be used for this case. His mother has helped him in the past with funding, and she may well step in to do that again. But I think we can be certain that no public funds will be used. Where does this all leave the other women who allege they were also trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein? Even though, obviously, they are not part of this case at all, I think it shows that there is a belief now in what went on, that it is not being swept under the carpet, that they are being recognised as victims of sex trafficking, and I think it opens the path for them to be believed and listened to and treated with the respect that they deserve, and that is what they haven't had. Juliet Reedon is the ABC's royal correspondent. As part of the settlement, Prince Andrew will make a substantial donation to Miss Dufresne's charity in support of victims' rights. Buckingham Palace has declined to comment on the settlement, saying it's a matter for the Prince and his legal team. This episode was produced and mixed. Okay, I'm cutting it out. I don't know. Oh, I'm lost. Oh my god, my god. Excuse me. Be nice. Be good. I don't know. I I, I just put the thing in and <laughs> whatever, whatever. Opinion, 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 opinion. I love you. This is gone too far. Gone too far. Ba ba ba. Yeah, wa wa. Yeah, la la la. Bula ba ba. I love you. Peace out. Me from Australia, I love you. We have a lot of problems here. We've been protesting hardcore for this coronavirus. The way the hospital runs, the way the army is, the way the weapons are, the way of life. We are crying to death. We are sick of it. Trucks, convoy from Canada. We love you. And we must go now on the name of God. God, eh -oh, eh -oh, uh, wherever this goes to, wherever, God, 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 God,